Hello, Mr. Lavrov, and welcome to RT. Thanks for joining us. Today in the studio, we have journalists from RT Spanish, RT Arabic, and RT English. And if my colleagues don't mind, I'll start. 2013 has been a landmark year for Russian diplomacy. What is your personal assessment of the arrangement on Syria and Iran, and what do you think are the prospects for Geneva II talks? These are very positive agreements, and I believe they were made possible by our joint efforts. This is further proof that initiatives can only be put into action by our joint and sincere efforts that ensure a balance of interests and are in line with the international law. I wouldn't go as far as to say we've made a breakthrough this year in terms of Syria and Iran. First, the agreements to destroy the Syrian chemical arsenal and to convene the Geneva II conference, as well as the first stage agreement on further steps to resolve the Iranian nuclear issue, are the fruit of years-long efforts. At least when it comes to Syria, we are talking about three years of Russia's consistent efforts of defending international law. The same applies to the progress on Iran. For over three years, we'd been seeking two things. First, to get all the parties to the talks to agree that eventually Iran should have a recognized right to develop its peaceful nuclear program and enrich uranium to make fuel for nuclear power plants, while making sure that this program has no military dimension and that it is subject to total control of the IAEA and providing security of all the countries in the region, including Israel. But it took a very long time for our Western partners to start reasoning this way, the way which is fair, comprehensive, and takes into account the interests of the international community, Western countries, the regions, and Iran's interests. It also strengthens the nuclear non-proliferation regime. So we have managed to reach this deal right at the end of the outgoing year. Another thing we have been advocating for years is the necessity to draw up some kind of a roadmap. This expression has become a buzzword now. Since you can't resolve a conflict overnight, so we suggested moving forward step by step on the basis of reciprocity, which means Iran is to meet the demands set by the IAEA and supported by the UN Security Council, and the international community in its turn starts easing sanctions on Iran. It is supposed to continue until Iran has fully complied with all the requirements, and that is the moment when all the sanctions will be lifted. For a few years we have been advocating these two things, the so-called end game and the procedure of the dialogue, as well as promoting a political settlement in Syria. So this breakthrough, if it was indeed a breakthrough, was the result of Russia's long-term efforts and patience. When the Arab Spring began, Russia was said to be on the wrong side of history, to have lost the Arab world and the Middle East. Unfortunately, at the time our Western partners, and some of our partners in the region, by the way, weren't looking for solutions that would help stabilize the situation and help the nations in the region to implement their right to a better life. Instead, they opted for information warfare tactics. I'm just stating the facts. That's what was happening at the time and up until the beginning of this year. But I admit that in the end, our Western partners have come to important and wise decisions. So the breakthrough was the result of profound groundwork. And the second reservation about using the word breakthrough has to do with the future. The decisions regarding Syria and Iran are far from being fully implemented. As for destroying Syria's chemical stockpiles, everything is going according to plan, with minor deviations concerning the time frame of the interim stages, though the reasons for that are objective rather than subjective. I'm sure that the deadline for the complete destruction of Syria's chemical arsenal, June the 30th, will be met. As for Geneva II, we still have a long way to go. We don't know for sure that this conference will be successful. 
uh, we can talk about this in more detail later. I'm sure you'll have more questions on this issue. And as regards the Iranian nuclear program, we've only reached an agreement concerning the first phase. We have a detailed plan and technical experts are currently working on a time frame which very specifically describes all the steps that Iran and the international community will take reciprocally. But then we need to proceed to the second phase, which also needs a detailed plan of mutual steps by both sides until we reach a point which we may call final. So now we are at the intermediate stage. A lot has been done, but it's still too early to celebrate. There is a lot of hard work ahead of us. So instead of celebrating, we should probably be thinking how to bring these two extremely important processes to completion. Mr. Lavrov, let's stay on Syria and countries which have had Arab Spring revolutions. Could you please elaborate on the balance between democracy and security? How difficult this problem is? What lessons can we learn from Arab Spring revolutions? What dangers is this region facing today in terms of terrorism? I think more and more countries today embrace democracy as their way of organizing society and structuring their state. Russia made this choice a long time ago. It is our clear choice and it can be revised. We are convinced that democracy is the way the world and every country should follow. But we are also convinced that it is up to each nation to choose a specific model of democratic development and democratic institutions. Every country has to make that choice, taking into account its traditions, history and values. Yes, there are some universal criteria that have been adopted by all. I'm talking about things like the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, signed by all UN member states. But when, in addition to the universally accepted principles, certain countries seek to impose their own system of somewhat controversial values, which have only been around for the past couple of decades, insisting on them as universal obligations, this leads to conflicts and causes certain nations to interfere with the internal affairs of other countries, imposing their model of democracy on others. This is no longer democracy. This kind of forced democratization results in instability. This happened when Americans invaded Iraq. This happened when NATO blatantly overstepped the UN Security Council mandate and bombed Libya. And this kind of external intervention is also happening in a number of other countries in the region. The Syrian conflict is another example of a situation where you have terrorists from all over the world, including Europe, US and Russia, fighting there to turn Syria and in fact this whole region into a caliphate. So forced democratization by outside forces undermines stability and produces new threats. Greater stability, on the other hand, provides the best environment for democratic reforms. So when the conference on Syria opens, and I really hope that the conference will go ahead as planned on January the 22nd, I hope the opposition doesn't come up with some unacceptable conditions contrary to the Russian-American initiative, I strongly believe this conference should focus on fighting terrorism as this is the main threat to Syria and other countries in the region today. Certainly, there will be other issues on the agenda, including pressing humanitarian issues, discussions on the political process, organizing the elections, provisional institutions for the transitional period. But all this should be based on a common understanding between the government and the opposition just the way it was captured in the Geneva communique produced at the first Geneva conference. So I really hope that our Western partners and our partners in the region, which have more influence on the opposition than anybody else, will make sure, firstly, that the opposition is properly represented at this conference, and secondly, that the opposition attends the conference without any preconditions.
The very point of the Russian-American initiative is that the people of Syria should agree on how to implement the principles captured in the Geneva communique of June 30, 2013, without any external intervention or any preconditions. But so far, unfortunately, we don't know what the regime's opponents, who have recently formed the National Coalition, will do. We are alarmed by the fact that the National Coalition does not seem to have complete unity. We are also alarmed by the fact that the National Coalition keeps saying that this conference must result in a regime change, or that a regime change is a prerequisite for having the conference. This is something we have never agreed to. We are also alarmed by the fact that the National Coalition does not seem to have complete control over all the groups fighting the regime on the ground. Another concern is that we see among the rebels an increasing number of jihadists who pursue extremist objectives. They want to set up a caliphate and impose Sharia laws, and basically they are already terrorizing minorities. They have formed what they call an Islamic front, and some of our partners in the West are even flirting with it, even though we know from our confidential contacts with them that they know pretty well that the organizations which formed the Islamic Front are not much different from Jabhat al-Nusra or the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. This alarms us. Incidents of anti-Christian violence are happening time after time. Before the crisis, there were two million Christians living in Syria. Now there's probably less than a million left. We don't have reliable statistics, but I believe at least a million Christians are now refugees. We all know about the most outrageous incidents, and your channel covered some of them. There was an incident at St. Thakla convent when nuns were taken hostage by terrorists. This incident happened near the town of Mealula, the only place in the world where people still speak Aramaic, the language of Jesus Christ. And we know from our contacts with Christian communities in Syria and throughout the region that they are very worried, because Christians have been living in the Middle East for 2,000 years, and now all this can be over. So first of all, it is necessary to come to an agreement on what the future Syria should be like. Fighting terrorism is the number one priority. As far as the political process is concerned, the government and the opposition should first of all put on paper their common vision of Syria's future, that Syria should be a sovereign, independent country whose territorial integrity is universally recognized and where the rights of all the ethnic, religious and political groups are respected, so they all feel secure and they are all involved in the political process. Who should be in the government, on the other hand, and who should organize the elections? These matters are secondary. The biggest threat comes today from those who seek to defeat the government on the battlefield and set up a totally different state. Of course, the humanitarian situation worries us as well, and perhaps we do more than anybody else to address these problems by working together with the government and UN agencies. We are making progress, although it is a difficult job. After all, there is real war going on in a large part of the country. We help both directly by sending humanitarian cargo like medicine, food and other things, and indirectly by making donations to various UN humanitarian agencies and the International Committee of the Red Cross. But some people are trying to take advantage of this humanitarian crisis for their own purposes, just like they did with the chemical weapons. They get extremely emotional on this issue, and like they did with the chemical weapons, they blame the government for everything, including the humanitarian crisis. They had the UN General Assembly adopt a resolution 
which gives a completely distorted picture of what is actually happening on the ground. This resolution is extremely ideologized. At least a much smaller number of nations supported this resolution compared to a similar resolution adopted a year earlier. Now they say they will send what they call a humanitarian resolution to the UN Security Council. This resolution will demand that the government should take certain steps unilaterally and threaten the government with actions based on Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. This plan has no future. What worries us is that we see increased activity on the part of the people who come up with such spoilers before the Geneva II conference. The opposition says they will only take part in the conference if their various demands are met. Sometimes they insist on a regime change, sometimes they say they need guarantees that there will be a regime change immediately after the conference, sometimes they say they will only take part in the Geneva conference after the humanitarian crisis is taken care of. But in reality, the humanitarian crisis gets worse mostly because of the militants, because of the groups which many countries have officially recognized as extremist and terrorist. So we do need to address humanitarian issues, but instead of fighting symptoms, we should fight the root cause of the crisis. And the root cause of the crisis is that the terrorist threat is extremely serious in Syria today. And the government and the opposition should come to an agreement on the key parameters regarding the future of their country, like I said earlier. By the way, I should also mention that at the G8 summit in Loch Ern in June, all the leaders of the G8 countries urged both the Syrian government and the opposition in their communique to join their forces in fighting terrorists in order to defeat those terrorists and drive them out of Syria. This, I believe, is our top priority today. Once the situation stabilizes, once the rights of all minorities are secured, once the multi-ethnic and multi-faith nature of the Syrian state is secured, democratic institutions will follow. Stability is the number one priority today. Welcome to the future. New Year isn't here yet, but there's already been plenty to celebrate this December. On this month's show, we learn how the future of Femto Lasers is set in stone, how to make movies with an instant messenger, and a revolutionary exoskeleton makes light work of heavy lifting. One technology update here on RG. We've got the future covered. Dramas that can't be ignored. Stories others refuse to notice. Faces changing the world right now. A full picture of today's news. Live, on demand, from around the globe. Rockley.tv Russia is often portrayed abroad as a country that tends to act rashly, even though Russia's foreign policy is anything but rash. Would you say that Cold War cliches are still a major influence in international affairs today? I agree that attempts to portray our actions as rash and emotional have nothing to do with the reality. This may be part of the information war I mentioned earlier. If you look at what we did with Syria and Iran, for example, you will get a totally different picture. We're always pragmatic and flexible. We never corner ourselves, like some did more than two years ago when they said that acid was no longer legitimate and did not represent anyone. This was a rash and emotional statement by some of the world leaders. How can you say that he doesn't represent anybody, while in reality he's backed by a significant portion of the population, if not the majority, due to a number of reasons? It's not because he's vastly adored by the people, but because a lot of people depend on him. 
it's not just the minorities. A lot of Sunni depend on him. Whatever you might think of it, many of them have successfully run their businesses during the rule of the Assad family, and they are convinced that in the case of a violent regime change, without any political settlement, their businesses might be taken away from them. So Assad does represent a significant portion of the population. And statements like, he's not a legitimate president, or you can write him off, this is a prime example of hasty and premature decisions. Syria inevitably comes to mind no matter what issues we are talking about today. Currently, the attitude of the West is different. They are becoming increasingly realistic in their approaches towards the settlement of the Syrian crisis. Whatever their official spokesmen say, number one problem is the threat of terrorism. The threat of jihadists coming to power in Syria and establishing a caliphate with an extremist order, the threat of undermining the rights of or even exterminating the Syrian minorities. Our Western partners are becoming increasingly aware that regime change is not a solution. Quite the opposite, regime change can make it easier for the terrorists to come to power. So hopefully, our Western partners will do whatever it takes to convene the Geneva II conference. We've done our share. The Syrian government has picked its delegates. The opposition has not done it yet. So I do hope that as the understanding of the situation in Syria and the region sinks in, our partners will work hard to complete their part of the job in the way that we have earlier agreed on. Talking of uh, Russian foreign policy in general, we have an official concept that outlines its key principles. We pursue relations with other countries that are equal, pragmatic, and mutually beneficial. We will defend our legitimate national interests in a determined and consistent way, but without engaging in any confrontation. In his annual address to the Federal Assembly, Russian President Vladimir Putin clearly reaffirmed our policy. In particular, he said that Russia doesn't claim to be a superpower on the global arena. Russia doesn't want to lecture anyone, but Russia wants to be a leader in promoting international law and the principles that are enshrined in the UN Charter. Patience is required to achieve success in international affairs, to resolve crises like the Syrian or the Iranian one. Let's talk about Russian neighbors. Recently, we've been hearing anti-Russian rhetoric in Ukraine and some other post-Soviet countries. Don't you think it's happening too often? It's sad that we still see these things happening so many years after the end of the Cold War. The main antagonists who contributed to this coldness in the world are no longer there. Uh, at least the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact are gone, unlike NATO. It's not constructive to rely on the phobias of the bygone era. It's a short-sighted policy. Our goal is to live with all our neighbors in peace. We used to live as part of one state together with them, including the Baltic states. And it was thanks to our joint efforts that these countries have robust production, the industries that drive the economic growth and infrastructure. As the Soviet Union was collapsing, our Western partners told us that Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia had a lot of phobias regarding the past and that once they become members of NATO, they would feel secure. It never happened that way. True, we are developing economic and cultural ties with these countries, and we want to see them strengthening. But when they get together at the NATO summit, we hear them voicing Russian phobias. Here is an example. We have a discussion platform called the Russia-NATO Council, where we debate many issues, including the missile shield, of course, which is the main stumbling block in our relations with the US. We've talked about this issue at length. We want the Russian NATO Council to be a confidence-building tool. 
confidence is what we desperately need in the Euro-Atlantic. The level and volume of our economic, humanitarian, educational and scientific ties with Europe is huge and is growing every year. And it's a striking contrast to the low level of trust in terms of politics and defense. To improve that, we've been suggesting sharing information on different aspects, advocating transparency on military exercises that are taking place near our respective borders. For example, during my visit to Poland, my counterpart has expressed satisfaction with the level of transparency we had regarding the recent drills, West 2013. Later, NATO held their uh, steadfast jazz 2013 exercise in Poland and in the Baltic states. But unlike West 2013, which focused on combating terrorism, steadfast jazz followed the procedures outlined in Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which is all about collective defense. In the run-up to the exercise, we asked our NATO partners who they were supposed to be defending against. It's a relevant question, since the drills were to take place next to our borders with the Baltic states and Poland, and we didn't get any coherent reply. But once the exercise was over, Poland and the Baltic states announced that the exercise had demonstrated that the alliance was capable of defending their countries from a threat from the east. Mr. Lavrov, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you.